Hello again. Uh, shortly, we'll be joined by uh, Steve Purnell, who is going to talk to us about developing markers for breeding bees. Uh, Steve is uh, educated at the University of Manitoba in Canada, and he's currently a research scientist for the Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada and works at Beaver Lodge up in Alberta. So he's looking for the best way to breed and select bees. So let's hear what he's got to say on that. So over to you, please, Steve. My name's Dr. Steve Purnell, and I'm very pleased to be with you here today uh, to speak to the British Beekeepers Association uh, spring uh, meeting in 2021. I'm quite disappointed I couldn't have been in England uh, to speak to you in person. I was supposed to be there uh, last year at this time, but uh, I guess we'll have to suffice with a, a virtual talk. Today I'm going to talk to you about recent work done in our lab with developing markers for breeding bees. I guess what I'd just like to start off by saying is that um, I work uh, for Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, so I'm a research scientist uh, with our federal government in the, the Department of Agriculture. And uh, I work uh, in a small research station in northern Alberta uh, called uh, Beaver Lodge, or near the town of Beaver Lodge. And um, I, I would also like to mention uh, that I've been working on uh, several projects involving markers for breeding bees for uh, several years, and I work with a large team. So the work I'm presenting today is certainly um, attributed to many research teams. And I would just like to mention a few people here uh, so certainly I've worked with Dr. Leonard Foster for many years, uh, more recently with Dr. Amro Zayad, and also on more recent projects with Pierre Agiovinezzo, uh, Dr. Rob Curry, uh, Renata Borba, that was my postdoctoral fellow in one of the projects I'll be talking to you about today, also Dr. Shelley Hoover and uh, Dr. Marta Gorna. So I uh, certainly like to acknowledge uh, all of their uh, support uh, in all of this work that the majority of our funding was provided by Genome Canada and regional genomic agencies with other contributions uh, from other agencies and supporters as well. Okay, probably the biggest question in your mind is, where do I work? Well, I work uh, in Beaver Lodge, Alberta. So just to put that into perspective for those of you that don't know, and I'm sure most of you don't. Anyways, this is a map of Canada. I work in the province of Alberta in the western portion of the country, and uh, Beaver Lodge is right there at the tip of the arrow. So we're just above the 55th parallel. We're actually somewhat northerly in Canada, although certainly not in the far north, but we're located in an area called the Peace River District, uh, which is uh, an area of agriculture in northern Alberta that's really characterized uh, in terms of beekeeping uh, by its high productivity per hive. So we've among the highest, I think, annual uh, honey yields per colony almost anywhere in the world. And that's really because of the abundance uh, of our very favorable uh, forage and also our very long days in the summertime, uh, which allow bees to fly for many hours. So I work at a small research station that's been there for uh, over a hundred years now. Uh, and there's been continuous bee research there for a number of years. So that's where I'm from, uh, and that's where I'm speaking uh, from today. And um, this is a sort of a lead into this topic. So why are we talking about uh, bee breeding and developing methods for developing markers for bee breeding? It's really been derived from uh, fundamental issues in Canadian beekeeping. Uh, certainly in Canada, we've been experiencing what most of the rest of the world has, certainly high levels of colony loss for many years. That's attributable to many factors, including uh, the usual culprits, including uh, varomites, uh, things like viruses, uh, nosema, also certainly the severity of our winters, which can have uh, an incremental impact on the uh, severity of loss. Many of our beekeepers also cite the fact that queens don't last as long as they used to. Uh, they're poor queens. They uh, get superseded earlier. And that's certainly been a recurring theme uh, cited by many of our beekeepers. And, and of course, we do have influences, negative influences of agrochemicals in the environment and also the mitocides we use in our own hive. So focusing back on the queens, what's unique about Canada is Canada, perhaps unlike some other countries in the world, has a very heavy reliance on imported queens. This is because our spring uh, doesn't uh, necessarily come early enough in our country to produce queens that can be used to establish new colonies that'll be large enough to produce a large honey crop. Uh, and certainly uh, our tradition over many uh, years has been to import queens in particular 
uh, from other localities, particularly to make up winter losses, but also to establish new colonies uh, that'll be uh, productive over the summer. So um, this heavy reliance on imported queens is somewhat precarious. Um, we're always worried about the health status of queens coming into Canada, worried about uh, bringing in diseases and invasive genetics, and uh, perhaps bringing in stock that's simply not bred uh, that's going to be productive in our climate. So just to illustrate this fact a little more, I uh, put together some figures over uh, the previous five years, um, particularly where I can get numbers of packages coming into Canada. So over 2014, 2018, if I were to generalize, Canada brings in package bees. Typically a package, if you're not familiar, is typically a kilo of bees uh, with a queen, sort of an instant uh, colony, if you will, that you can hive on equipment. Uh, it's been a long history of package importation into Canada, which is also um, a great for uh, establishing new colonies or making up losses. But depending on the year, we probably import between 30 and 60,000 packages per year, primarily right now from New Zealand. So New Zealand is our, our biggest supplier of package fees. And we import uh, on average between about 200 and 250,000 queens. Uh, many of these come from the US, from Hawaii and California specifically. Smaller amounts can come from other countries as well. So we're very highly leveraged on these imports, particularly from the US for Queens and also uh, for packages uh, from uh, New Zealand and a few other minor sources. So Canada brings in uh, relatively large numbers to the populations of bees we have in our country. So um, what about Queens and what about selection? Certainly um, a great answer would be to uh, build up our own queen industry and produce very high quality Queens to lessen that reliance on imported Queens and to breed really high quality queens that are disease resistant, productive, and certainly make it through our winters. So uh, although beekeepers can certainly select for a number of traits and their own beekeeping operations that are fairly obvious, they might be aggressiveness or they might be the ability to produce honey uh, or survive winter under the conditions they are. Uh, many of these other traits are, are trickier to select for if you're selecting for varroa resistance or looking for a specific behavior, such as varroa sensitive hygiene. Uh, these are very much research-based techniques. And I think what we wanted to really ask ourselves at the beginning of all of this is could we really move bee selection and breeding into the 21st century using markers uh, that we could look for, analyze bees for, uh, and tell beekeepers that certain colonies would be really advantageous to breed from because that would uh, confer them uh, disease resistance, etc. So really this work started a number of years ago. I've worked uh, with Leonard Foster uh, for quite a number of years and uh, we were really interested in initially looking for markers and, and Leonard really is a proteomics expert. So uh, Leonard uh, works at the University of British Columbia, runs a core facility uh, for uh, examining uh, proteomics and uh, our early efforts really over these initial two projects, which I'm going to cover for you today and then lead into a description of a third project really was to look at the utility of using uh, what might be a, a really unique marker for identifying traits in bees and breeding them. So this covered off two projects. One is called APIS and one is called BIPM. One was sort of a search for proteomic markers and the second was a validation of this technique. I'm not going to go into details of a number of these projects in the length of time we have today, but I'm going to sort of touch on some of the salient points, I think, uh, that we can uh, bring to the fore. So really in this first project, um, we were really interested in looking at protein expression, which hasn't been done to a great extent in bees. So working with Leonard, uh, we were interested in looking at what tissues uh, differentially express proteins and whether in fact we could find proteins that were really functionally linked to a trait. So uh, we felt that looking at proteins as markers would tell us that a trait was being um, expressed and really uh, the expression of proteins would tell us whether a trait was present. And this would be essentially a more stable marker to use for breeding. Uh, also in this project in a broader sense, this was somewhat exploratory. We were looking at a number of traits linked uh, with varroa resistance and also resistance to American fowl brood. And we were, we were looking at the relative heritability of some of those traits to try and determine which trait uh, might be the best to develop markers for in this uh, initial exploration. So when you um, are doing a project, when you're looking at uh, traits and markers, 
Uh, typically, you've got to start off with a base population that has some variability. So we assembled a base population in three locations in British Columbia uh, and Alberta. Uh, again, uh, the focus of this project was to look at resistance traits that conferred resistance to uh, Varroa and also American fowl brood disease. And uh, with many of these breeding projects, when we're looking uh, at traits, um, <clears throat> we have to assess the populations. This is certainly what we did in year one and year two after they were assessed. And this went through a complex breeding design in which we could estimate heritability of these traits through uh, what was a dialogue structured cross, uh, but also uh, allowed us to use proteomics to sort of uh, determine whether we saw a protein expression for a trait in uh, certain crosses that were very highly expressing a behavior or had intermediate expression or low expression. So suffice to say, assemble a breeding population that's diverse and go through a sort of an elegant structure to uh, produce sort of highs and lows for these traits. And then we looked at protein expression in these bees. So again, uh, just another slide, just uh, amplifying the fact that we had a very diverse base population with imported queens we brought in um, under importation protocols from different locations uh, and certain strains we knew the industry had used, such as Buckfast, for example, uh, Russian or VSH, <clears throat> that uh, certainly were resistant to Varroa. So we had detailed records from 142 colonies in a couple of these locations. And uh, the way the study worked, and again, in a very general sense, is we would establish units that were very homogenous in size. They would be what I would call like package units. They might have a kilo of bees. Uh, we would introduce the queen we'd imported from. We'd let her establish, uh, produce brood. And then we would run various assays to determine whether her progeny expressed these traits. And then we could sample uh, her progeny for the expression of these proteins. Again, just showing setup of some of these colonies. I see an old style package box actually in the upper brood chamber and us weighing the bees to create these equally sized units. Again, uh, in this first project, I'm really not going to go into the details of, of what we measured, but here's a slide just indicating some of these phenotypes we measured or uh, some of these traits. And they included actually the varroa mite population growth, for example, <clears throat> uh, or total populations of mites, both on the brood and on bees. Grooming behavior, looking at damaged mites, and the number of mites that were actually groomed off of uh, the colonies, uh, relative infestation of worker brood, and also looking at how many of those uh, mother mites uh, in brood cells uh, were fertile. Hygienic behavior, which I'll talk about more in this presentation, really looking at how many uh, cells could be removed uh, that were frozen within 24 or in this study, 48 hours, and also a more intensive looking at uh, varroa sensitive hygiene uh, and also recapping rate. So again, a very quick description of some of these uh, resistant phenotypes we measured, really asking ourselves uh, with a differential expression of all of these different uh, traits, whether uh, we could associate them with differential protein expression, which was very unique. So the place I want to bring you to is we ran a large study and did some rather pioneering things. And at the end of all of that, um, Leonard was a real wizard and could look at protein expression in all of these different tissues uh, and across um, many thousands of analyses. Really, the behavior that was most uh, easily predicted by the expression of proteins was hygienic behavior. So what we found is that there were a certain number of peptides indicative of proteins uh, that could be looked at in the antennae of nurse bees. So we could sample nurse bees, uh, we could sample their antennae, and Leonard could show us that certain, the expressions of certain proteins were very predictive of whether the hygienic behavior uh, was going to be expressed or not. So uh, you just see some representative graphs here and relative hygienic behavior uh, expression on the uh, vertical axis and um, the upregulation or downregulation of proteins, specific proteins uh, across the x-axis. And uh, it really shows a tight relationship between uh, proteins being expressed in the antennae of these nurse bees and the propensity for hygienic behavior to actually happen. And to a lesser extent, also varroa sensitive hygiene. So we had uh, these proteins, which could be felt could serve as markers that were predictive hygienic behavior and to a lesser extent, some of the varroa resistance behaviors. So at the end of this project, what we were able to do is create a panel of uh, 12 markers. Uh, you can see here, and these markers 
uh, we felt would be predictive of bees showing certain resistance traits. And what's kind of interesting with these markers is a number of them uh, are uh, functionally linked to odorant binding and uh, transmissions of signals within nerves. Um, and uh, they uh, do make sense relative to a bee being able to perceive odors uh, from their antennae and trying to detect abnormalities in brood. So at the end of the project, um, we didn't develop uh, pregnancy test kits, which these look like. These are lateral flow devices. But conceptually, one thing we said is, you know, eventually we could get to the point, perhaps if we wanted to go this way of developing a quick test kit, which would tell us whether in fact one or some of these uh, individual proteins would be present and that a beekeeper might be able to sample uh, his own bees to determine whether those proteins are present and whether in fact his colonies would be highly hygienic. So I'd like to emphasize right now, this is still a lab-based assay. We have to actually uh, assay um, nurses sample from colonies to make this prediction. We can't do it by a field test device, but conceptually this shows us that we can use this technology to predict, uh, we had hoped, uh, the propensity for these colonies to exhibit hygienic behavior. So um, that was kind of a very long road that took uh, a number of colonies, a lot of detailed assay work, but we found proteins primarily predictive of hygienic behavior. But going from there to the field is another huge step, and that's actually led to a second project. And really the fundamental question we wanted to answer here is, could we use these proteins we felt could be used as markers? Uh, could we actually use them in real life settings to select and breed bees that would actually be more resistant to uh, various behaviors? So, uh, in fact, we attempted to do this. We set up a very large scale project and we worked with a number of collaborators. So this is a map of Western Canada. The happy faces <laughs> show us uh, labs or um, some of the coordinating centers in which this work was done. So this is us in Beaver Lodge, Alberta, Leonard Foster at the University of British Columbia. Uh, cooperating uh, bee breeders uh, was Huckster and Terry Huckster uh, with Kettle Valley Queens and Grand Forks, uh, British Columbia. Uh, also uh, working with Shelley Hoover in the Lethbridge area and Rob Curry uh, at the University of Manitoba. So we uh, worked carefully and uh, we certainly uh, set up a large design to really ask this question about whether these markers were functional in breeding better bees. So uh, in order to do this, we actually surveyed a large proportion of commercial stock uh, in that uh, we went to beekeepers all across Western Canada. We, we actually met with beekeepers uh, that bred their own bees uh, and um, we surveyed them for hygienic behavior. Uh, and we later asked uh, beekeepers uh, for samples of their stock and we created uh, populations from which we further selected. So we split up this commercial stock that we tested at the start of this study into two breeding populations, uh, what we called our F0. We also randomly chosen uh, queens as our benchmark uh, to make comparisons against. So this would serve as our non-selected population. So again, we surveyed the commercial population and then we used proportions of this to set up essentially the start of our breeding populations in different locations. Again, not going into too many details here, but we went through uh, three years of selective uh, breeding in which we produced um, an F1 through an F3. Actually, we did the F1 and F2 in a single year. Uh, these were done through instrumental insemination. And then we did many evaluations with the stock along the way, particularly comparing the results of the F1 after one generation of selection to uh, the F3. I'm not going to go through all these results, but we did economic analysis. We did disease challenges uh, uh, with American fowl brood disease or challenges with varroa mites to see whether the selected stock was more resistant. Again, um, we did a similar thing in the F3, and we also distributed some of these queens for beekeeper evaluation. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the disease and uh, varroa challenges here uh, as the result of this study. <clears throat> So again, I think the way to think about this is we did sort of a, a I like to say a head-to-head -head challenge. We uh, actually compared the gains we would make through selection using traditional methods of using a hygienic behavior assay in the field, which we called FAST or the field assay selection. And we compared it against using our proteomic markers, uh, calling this marker assisted selection or MASS, and then compared the gains 
uh, using both. So for those of you not familiar, and I think the beekeeping community around the world is uh, fairly familiar with hygienic behavior, uh, this is a behavioral mechanism which really uh, relates to the rapid detection and removal of diseased or dead brood. So bees exhibiting hygienic behavior uh, are normally more resistant to disease infections uh, like American fowl brood and also tend to be um, more resistant to mites as well. So the way we would traditionally assay for this without the use of fancy markers is we would freeze brood uh, with liquid nitrogen. Here you can see tubes. These are PVC tubes in which we pour liquid nitrogen uh, on sealed brood. Uh, and uh, 24 hours later, we come back uh, after this um, frame is reinserted back to a colony. And we actually count the number of cells in each of those two patches uh, that really has, um, uh, still has brood in it uh, that has not been removed or has been uh, removed by the hygienic action of the bees. So if a colony is really hygienic, the patch after 24 hours will look like this. You'll see a bunch of cleaned out cells. Um, and if it's like this, it's super non-hygienic. This is almost unrealistic. You would always have some uh, level of hygienic behavior, uh, but this would show an extreme difference between the two. And typically we would use a benchmark of 95% removal in 24 hours, uh, consistently over a couple of tests to call a colony a highly hygienic. So we used that method for selecting uh, these colonies and we also compared it to our markers. So uh, certainly for the markers, we would uh, have to actually analyze the antennae of nurse bees and see which colonies were expressing those proteins to make decisions about which colonies to breed from. So that would be the alternative. So I mentioned we uh, did use instrumental insemination to very highly controlled breeding in the first two generations. So this just shows some pictures of instrumental insemination in case, in case you haven't uh, ever seen this before. And in the lower uh, portion of the screen, you can see uh, Shelley Hoover was working on the project, actually performing some of these inseminations. So this is semen collection in the upper uh, left where you evert the endophallus of the drone to collect the semen. And uh, we use a device this is a Chalet device actually to do these inseminations. Uh, there's Sue Kobe, who is uh, known, I would say internationally for expertise in instrumental insemination. And she also was along in this project to uh, give us a hand and certainly help us do the number of inseminations we had to do to uh, get through each of these uh, generations. Again, if you're doing selective breeding, you're gonna tag these queens so we can identify them to make sure your selectively bred queen is in the colony and producing the brood uh, and progeny that you're analyzing. It also involves uh, treatment of CO2 to uh, narcotize the queen while you're inseminating um, the virgin. And also, again, uh, once she's been inseminated after a period of time to uh, entice her into laying. Okay, um, so we had this very uh, complex design. Uh, we uh, actually went through a couple of generations of breeding and, and what were really the results? So I'm just gonna pause here for a second, try and explain this because um, some people might say this is the money shot or really this is, what are the key results from this experiment? So on the left, this indicates um, the level of hygienic behavior uh, we saw in the stock across the provinces, British Columbia, Alberta, and Manitoba. Pre-selection, when we visited all these beekeepers that bred their own stock, uh, if we combine them into a single uh, mean, uh, this is what it would look like here. All the stock had roughly hygienic behavior in the 70% range uh, being unselected for that generally. And when we took a subsample of that population, which we called a benchmark, we tested it and we showed that its hygienic behavior performance was very representative of the entire unselected population. So again, this is pre-selection and this is post-selection. So in this side of the graph, we see what the effects of selection were after one, the F1 or three generations comparing our marker assisted selection or our field assisted selection using tr the traditional hygienic behavior test. And what I just want to bring to your attention is the benchmarks don't change much even after uh, three generations in which they were not selected and we would, would not expect movement uh, in that benchmark hygienic behavior value. But if we used uh, our marker assisted selection or traditional methods of selection, you see increases in the level of hygienic behavior with selection after one generation or three. And what I particularly want to bring your attention for is we did increase and enrich that level of that trait, the hygienic behavior uh, using our markers alone, which is very comparable to what we achieved through traditional methods of selection. So this is a really important point. Uh, we were able to use proteins as markers to select bees that uh, 
express hygienic behavior to a greater degree, which is, was very unique scientifically in the first real demonstration of um, using protein markers actually in animal breeding. So that was uh, a pretty big find for us. And after a lot of effort, it was pretty grat gratifying to see we could use these proteins to enrich hygienic behavior. Um, hygienic behavior is great, but we also asked further questions in the same project. We produced many progeny queens, <clears throat> uh, many queens rather, and uh, we had uh, many progeny colonies. And we wanted to ask whether these colonies that were selected for hygienic behavior also were generally more resistant to uh, varroa mites and also American fowl brood disease. So of course, uh, varroa mites um, are uh, public enemy number one with uh, pretty much any beekeeper. Um, I often put up a, a quote uh, used by one of my predecessors, uh, Tibor Zabel, who worked at the same institution I did many years ago. Tibor just recently passed away and Tibor was a breeder the full time. Uh, anyways, uh, varroa resistance is a tough thing to do. But what we specifically measured with these selected colonies is whether they had greater varroa sensitive hygiene. So varroa sensitive hygiene very generally is um, the ability to remove uh, a disproportionate number of <clears throat> pupae that are infested with uh, varroa mites. And um, also looking at their ability to remove them uh, when the mites are actively reproducing and that is, are they removing uh, pupae and mites from cells in which the mites are actually actively reproducing as opposed to being non-fertile? So what we're really looking here uh, in the test we use, which we call the seven-day quick test, which is uh, adapted from uh, the test uh, developed at Baton Rouge, the U.S. DA facility there um, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, is we looked at how many of uh, the uh, might infested pupae were removed in a seven day test. And also uh, what was the resulting fertility of the mites that remained in the brood? So we're looking at two aspects, removal and the fertility of the mites remaining in the brood. So to do this, what we actually did is we took frames <clears throat> typically of um, white eyed uh, pupae. So cat brood from a donor colony that was genetically unrelated, uh, but that in fact uh, did have mites. We put this into the colonies we bred and we looked seven days later at what was happening underneath the cap. So before the start of the test, we'd take a row of these cells, uh, up to 200 cells, uh, and uncap them and look to see how many were infested with mites and how many of those mites uh, had mite families or were in fact fertile and were reproducing. You took these frames out seven days afterwards and did the same evaluation. So what proportion of the brood contained mites and what proportion of those mites were actually fertile. So those are the two metrics we're actually using to determine how strongly uh, these colonies were expressing varroa sensitive hygiene. And here you can see the difference between an unselected colony and one expressing a lot of varroa sensitive hygiene. You see a higher degree of uh, cells that are actually uncapped um, by these bees. And also if you count up the particularly the rate of removal, it's usually much higher in these varroa sensitive hygiene colonies. Okay, so if you do that assay and actually look at the results, again, I'm gonna show you sort of our selected versus non-selected uh, colonies. The F1, this is after one generation of selection, F2 and F3 after three generations of selection. And if we just focus on the right-hand part of this graph, we found that after three generations of selection, we had a higher expression of removal of mite-infested brood, which is one of the hallmarks of VSH. Uh, both for our market-assisted selection colonies and also the colonies in which we did traditional selection uh, using the freeze-killed brood assay. So another good indication um, using both types of methods of selection uh, that we can actually improve uh, mite-resistant traits. Uh, further, we're also very interested in looking at um, resistance to disease. I've looked at American fowl brood in the past and um, we do some nasty things with our colonies in which we can actually inoculate them with American fowl brood disease. Horror of horrors, this is um, what might be called anti-beekeeping, but a really great way to infect your colonies with AFB is to introduce um, frame pieces. Um, we cut them out of colonies that have died from American fowl brood disease, and we can count up the number of cells that have AFB scale in them, <clears throat> or in fact, ropey brood, and use that as a more or less constant level of inoculum to place back to these colonies for the colonies to generate AFB symptoms themselves. So uh, again, uh, we artificially inoculated them with uh, AFB clinical symptoms, uh, again, coming from other colonies that had died. Uh, and we looked at the progress of 
disease development of these colonies uh, over uh, several weeks. So uh, without going again into too many details, we would standardize these inoculations. We would assess these uh, colonies every couple of weeks and look at the development of the disease within the colony. We'd also do things like cultivate uh, the organism microbiologically and actually count spores that were circulating in honey and in the bees of the colonies as well, just to confirm we have the disease. Again, if you're looking for AFB, if you see this in your colony, um, that is bad news because it's in an AFB scale, uh, which would be on the bottom side of the scale cell rather. So this is the dried down remains of a putrefied uh, larva pupa uh, with the disease. Here you can see bees actually working a frame where you have uh, these putrefied remains drawing down into a scale as they work. Anyways, um, if you artificially infect colonies and compare them, this is over two generations, the F1 and the F3, you can see that um, certainly uh, you can create AFB infections. Here we have the benchmark, the field assay selection, the free scale brood assay, in other words, our marker, assisted selection stock. And this is an imported stock uh, coming from uh, a source uh, we would normally get into Canada. We compare it as another uh, benchmark, so to speak. And if you look over time, all of these colonies will develop American fowl brood disease. Uh, this is the cumulative number of visible symptoms of either scale or ropey brood, and they are into the hundreds as the weeks develop. So this is weeks post-inoculation. But at least as a, at a gross sense, if you compare uh, sort of the end of this experimental period at week 12 in various years, you do see that we have significant differences in the gross number of symptoms between the different stocks and the lowest of which in this case was our field assay selection or our freeze killed brood assay selected stock uh, followed closely by our marker assisted selection stock actually in both of those years. So uh, certainly looking at gross numbers of symptoms, our selected stock was more resistant to AFB infection. Also, uh, you can use other metrics to compare these colonies. This graph shows the proportion of colonies that have any um, number of AFB symptoms. <clears throat> so um, here you can see the F1 and the F3 again. We're comparing <clears throat> our imported stock in yellow here, uh, which is uh, generally not very disease resistant. <clears throat> you can see that 100% of the colonies become infected at the start of the experiment on the F1 and remain infected. And in, in, in fact, there's no recovery. Yet if we look at the other uh, selected stocks or the benchmark stock as well, which is black, uh, you see various levels of uh, infection and recovery over time. But I'll point out the lowest levels are in our selected stocks. And this is true in the F3, where we have the lowest number of infected colonies at the end of the experiment. At the end of the F3, the benchmark is intermediate and our, what looks like our fairly susceptible imported stock still has relatively high numbers of infected colonies at the end of the experiment. So just more data showing you that with selection, uh, irrespective of the selection technique, we can get improvements in disease resistance with hygienic behavior. Uh, lastly, I always say that uh, one big selection uh, metric uh, in our um, part of the world is winter. Uh, we have long cold winters, there are some colonies being wintered outside. And if we look at the survival of the stock, looking at the proportion of colonies surviving, uh, we do have greater survival in our two selected stocks. Again, in this AFB challenge experiment compared to the benchmark, or in fact, the imported. So more evidence showing you that colonies not only have lower levels of AFB, they also will survive better over winter uh, with selection. Well, I'll just take a little brief break there because what I'm going to do now is um, more or less quickly review a uh, third generation of experiments where we really looked at going further with the development of some of our markers. So I've shown you that we were um, really kind of unique and pioneering in a way in developing markers that relate to protein expression in the antennae of nurse bees, and we could use them. And we proved that <clears throat> by selecting with them over a large scale experiment, we could improve metrics of resistance, but we really wanted to ask a broader question and a more ambitious questions in this next project. So to do this, we <clears throat> devised another project and gave it another catchy name. This one's called Biomics. I first like to recognize uh, Dr. Renata Borba, who was a postdoctoral fellow working in my lab in this project and who uh, developed a lot of the data I'm gonna be showing shortly. But <clears throat> instead of focusing just sort of on one or two traits, we decided to focus in on 12 uh, economically important traits and apply not only proteomics as we had in the past, but also genomics to develop a very robust marker panel. So we were introducing genomics 
and uh, all pre proteomics together to develop uh, a suite of markers, which we hope will be very predictive of a number of behaviors. So this is sort of taking it to the next level, if you will. Again, uh, this involved a number of collaborators across the country. Uh, again, us up in Northern Alberta in Beaver Lodge and a number of other of the collaborators that have worked on previous projects, uh, also including now uh, Amber Zayed's lab at York University, who is doing the proteomics work, uh, the Ontario Beekeeping Association and Laval University with Pierre Givinezzo. So I want to point out that the scale of this project was larger. We monitored approximately 1,000 colonies in Canada over two years. And we did a very, very standardized evaluation of resistance traits, took samples of the bees, which were used for proteomic and genomic analysis. I'm really not going to talk about all of this today, but I'll just point out to you, we monitored many, many things in different labs. So diseases, for example, economic traits that you as beekeepers would be interested in, like honey production, brood size, cluster size, overwintering and defensive behavior, social immunity traits like hygienic behavior, as we've talked about a lot, and also grooming behavior. We also had groups looking at the gut microbiome and innate immunity factors. But um, my lab was mainly responsible for this phenotype evaluation and really looking at um, these factors, social immunity, economic and management factors, and also pathogen loads in these colonies. So again, uh, for the phenotype part of the project, although this is a search for markers, we developed uh, and, and produced tons of phenotype data on these colonies uh, that sort of indicate how resistant they might be to certain factors or how much disease they might express. Uh, so we looked at the correlations among these phenotypes, which is a huge amount of data based on the number of colonies we analyzed across the country. We're also looking at the, these uh, with the relative importance of um, winter mortality, how all of these factors may relate to winter mortality. So this is a large study looking at developing markers, but I want to point out you have to develop uh, a lot of phenotype data in these colonies to search for these markers. If you're looking for uh, mutations, uh, for instance, uh, in the genome, you've got to relate these back to uh, differential expression of these phenotypes uh, in colonies. So you've got to look at a lot of colonies and test them and then compare the results of these tests back to the genome to look for consistencies in terms of markers in the genome. But the phenotypic data in itself is something uh, we studied and uh, it's also very informative. So when you're doing this work, again, we start out with very standard sized units. This is actually you know, one of my apries in which we're shaking colonies, uh, creating again, these one kilogram of bees and then uh, introducing queens. Uh, the queens used in this study would be representative of the queen population throughout Canada. So some beekeepers that would breed their own queens, for example, uh, a limited amount of imported queens in this study, but a very broad um, base of queens across the country uh, because um, that's representative of our population and also hopefully shows some variability in the traits we're measuring. So I'm now going to show you a couple of examples of some of the data we measured and some of the insights we have with that data. So certainly we measured hygienic behavior. I talked about this earlier uh, with the freeze kill brood assay, some pictures again using uh, two tubes per colony and two uh, repeated tests over uh, two weeks, and we could measure uh, the relative amount of hygienic behavior. So if you look at this graph, uh, the upper line would represent uh, what we would say colonies were that were highly hygienic, expressing 95% removal over 24 hours. And then along the bottom and then successive graphs, you'll see locations being colonies, either in Beaver Lodge, for example, uh, or you'll see uh, colonies uh, in British Columbia, the BC, uh, Lethbridge, uh, Manitoba, Ontario, or Quebec across the bottom. My pointer is acting up here, so uh, it's not moving exactly the way I want it to. What you, what you can see here uh, is that we have average values uh, located in the middle of those boxes. We can also see dots indicating outliers of the spread of the data, but this just shows there's variability in these populations. Some locations, the colonies like Beaver Lodge, for example, the colonies generally highly expressed hygienic behavior, also in Quebec, and this is probably also a legacy of some of the breeding projects we did in the past, and that some of our own colonies in our own operation uh, previously had uh, some uh, selection for hygienic behavior. You see more variability among the other sites, uh, lower expression of hygienic behavior, for example, in Manitoba. But we have to collect this data and then take samples of these bees and look at protein expression and also look at uh, mutations in the genome to try and find indicative markers that correspond to colonies that highly express this trait or don't express it much at all.
Again, uh, the, the red letters at the bottom that are popping up indicate the proportion of colonies we would categorize as being highly hygienic at each of these locations. Another trait we measured among many in this study uh, was honey production. Uh, certainly beekeepers are very interested in this. Uh, what we used is we measured honey production uh, over two weeks. We looked at a two week weight gain over the, fl over the flow, which is uh, very highly correlated with total weight gain. And we also measured total weight gain. Again, an example of another data set we collected that we would look for markers for as an example, this is two week honey production. I'll point out this is in kilograms. And again, if uh, you look at Beaver Lodge, the BEAV here, we see we have a very uh, large two week weight gain uh, in fact, because of our, our very favorable honey production characteristics. But again, just a spread of this data will, uh, shown across the country at many locations and the variability we see across the many colonies. The varroa resistance, uh, again, was um, evaluated in a very precise way. We did this actually by seeding populations with known numbers of varroa mites at the beginning of this experiment. So we had known quantities of bees and known quantities of mites at the beginning of the evaluation period. We did this actually by uh, anesthetizing bees containing mites in carbon dioxide. And if you look at the upper right picture, you can see we can actually collect mites uh, from these bees and actually introduce them into colonies. And then we would monitor them, particularly after an acaricidal treatment, which would remove all the mites uh, after the end of the season in which these mites populations could grow in these colonies. So we used a metric of mite population growth, which is um, called instantaneous mite population growth. Again, this is developed uh, by uh, scientists with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and it shows how quickly mites grow within a colony in terms of the starting population and final population. In our uh, experiment, this is over a period of between 13 and 17 weeks. And what you can do is you can calculate a value that tells you the overall resistance to the growth of mites in a colony from, from whatever resistance mechanisms are present in that colony uh, over that period. And I'll point out that a lower value is a more resistant colony. So you do see variation, again, in relative mite resistance in populations in different locations. And again, we had higher intrinsic mite uh, resistance in colonies in Beaver Lodge and Lethbridge compared to uh, locations such as Manitoba and Quebec. So we do see variability in this very precise measurement of varroa resistance behavior. And we also measure things like uh, quantities of viruses and other pathogens in colonies. Again, you see variability here. I won't go into detail about what these values means. These are quantitative values, lowest in Quebec on the right of this slide, for example, and highest in Manitoba in the second last column. Well, one thing that's interesting besides looking for markers is looking at all the data of these phenotypes and looking at levels of pathogens in these colonies because we can draw inferences. And they're important for a lot of reasons. One is asking ourselves, what colonies survive more and what characteristics or pathogen loads do they have? So really in looking at this, we found in our experiment, for example, we had higher levels of mortality for colonies in Manitoba, as you can see, in the uh, third bar. So uh, a traditional uh, level of winter mortality we might expect is 15%. Overall in this experiment, we had low uh, mortality of colonies, but among our sites uh, that were intensively managed and monitored these four locations, we saw highest levels in Manitoba, for example, and lowest in Quebec. We can also look at that survival uh, as to whether colonies are indoor wintered or outdoor winter because in this kind of large complex design, we did have two different wintering methods. So for those of you interested in the bottom picture, we can see in this slide, those are uh, colonies that uh, are within an indoor wintering room kept at about four to five degrees Celsius, which is common in Western Canada for wintering bees. And we did find very large differences in survival between indoor and outdoor wintered colonies. Uh, our indoor wintered colonies had substantially higher levels of survival, which isn't typically uh, normal for management uh, practices um, in general, often indoor and outdoor winter colonies would have similar levels of survival. So something's going on with our uh, outdoor winter uh, colonies versus our indoor winter colonies. So what we did to sort of investigate this is we looked at some of our data before winter and after winter. So if we looked at virus levels in colonies in the fall and compared them to survival, we could see that certainly a large proportion of our colonies that did not survive the winter had higher levels of certain viruses, particularly black queen cell virus, deformed wing virus, 
variant A and B, and also SAC root virus. So one common theme in terms of looking at all this phenotypic data we produced was that we could see higher levels of certain viruses in the fall for colonies that died. Another thing we found out, in fact, is that certain metrics that beekeepers could measure were very predictive of winter survival. So in fact, if you look at your colonies and you measured the weight before winter, certainly in terms of a, a cold temperate climate like we have, colonies that were heavier survived significantly better than colonies that were slightly lighter. And also colonies uh, that had higher levels of mites going into winter also had poorer levels of uh, survival, which isn't uh, particularly surprising. And this particular metric was the uh, number of um, phoretic mites on bees uh, after a treatment with an acaricide in the fall. So the more mites you have on bees actually either before your acaricide treatment in the fall or after your acaricide treatment in the fall is also very predictive of winter survival. So to sort of uh, bring home a little bit here, um, I just want to say that uh, we did considerable data analysis and whether we compared indoor or outdoor winter colonies, looking at all this phenotypic data we produced in our search for markers, we could tell a couple things and we could look at risk factors. And I'll just say that these factors were similar whether colonies were wintered indoors or outdoors. I'll point out we didn't measure sealed brood production in outdoor colonies, so that factor is not here. But if we focus just on the left-hand side of this graphic, just to be representative, the biggest risk factors we found in our study, again, in the search for markers and looking and analyzing all this phenotypic data that were predictive of whether a colony survived not over winter, were really things like its sealed brood area, uh, larger sealed brood areas, larger colony weights, and larger cluster sizes of bees in the fall were very predictive of survival. And these, again, can be easily measured by beekeepers. Whereas negative influences on colony survival over the winter were the presence of certain viruses, as I've mentioned previously, and also the presence of varroa, whether the numbers of phoretic um, varroa on bees before a fall caricidal treatment here or after a fall caricidal treatment here were both predictive of loss. So um, this is particularly powerful based on the number of colonies we analyzed in this experiment across the country, so at least in Canada and uh, most of our climates, these factors we may be able to look at more closely to be predictive and to manage uh, and to lessen winter losses. So I was supposed to be talking about markers here, but I wanted to mention that all this phenotypic data is very, very helpful uh, in understanding intercorrelations among some of these resistance traits and also the effects of disease uh, on uh, issues like winter survival. But I will just say, uh, just sort of to end this discussion, that in this particular project, we are using proteomics looking at proteins and genomics looking at DNA to find specific uh, markers that are predictive of a honeybee trait. So this is uh, ongoing. We don't actually have the markers from this project produced yet. Uh, certainly, this is being worked on very closely. Uh, in case you're wondering, we actually have to sample the legs off of bees, sampled from colonies, expressing all of these different traits to look at the relationships in the genome in terms of uh, what genetic factors might be related to highly expressing a resistance uh, trait or not. Uh, it's done by uh, next generation sequencing. This is a generic example of a sequencer, uh, but certainly is, uh, produces a tremendous amount of data. Uh, in the order of 20 terabytes of data is right now being analyzed to look at mutations in the genome to tell us uh, what might be associated with some of our resistance traits. Just a couple of very basic graphs to show you some of the um, results in progress. Uh, certainly what we're finding, um, we're looking for what are called single nucleotide polymorphisms or very tiny changes in the genome that are um, predictable of changes in the expression of a behavior. And if we look at something again with hygienic behavior, to use a common theme in this talk, we find uh, that there are uh, many individual mutations with small effects that affect the expression of some of these traits. This is actually one of the larger ones we're finding here with an individual SNP, as we say. So many smaller mutations combine uh, actually result in the uh, differential expression of a certain trait. And we are finding what we call SNPs or these very specific mutations in the genome uh, that are predictive of certain behaviors. And this is an example of one, uh, again, coming from Amrul Zayed's lab at uh, the York University, who is the geneticist on this project. The other thing we're finding is that there are some locations in the genome, this is uh, uh, associated with insulin receptor two uh, in the honeybee genome uh, that actually have multiple traits. So if you look at a region of the genome, there are many SNPs, as we would say, 
uh, that are predictive of several things. And in this case, this particular uh, locus is also giving us information about the expression of hygienic behavior, um, my population growth, two-week weight gain, and overall honey weight gain. And so these SNPs we think will be located uh, rather inherited in linkage blocks together uh, and are, again, uh, predictive of many traits at once at a particular location uh, in uh, the genome. The other thing uh, we're finding is that uh, some of them are associated uh, with intronic uh, areas of the genome. Uh, in other words, uh, certainly uh, areas of the genome uh, that um, are non-coding, as we would call. But anyways, without going into too many details, I think I'm just at a point of saying that certainly this work is in progress. We are finding SNPs that are linked to these behaviors and it's our uh, earnest hope that we'll find uh, SNPs and make SNP panels, as we would say, that can be analyzed for in bees that will tell you uh, as beekeepers uh, or us as researchers whether your bees will be expressing uh, certain resistance traits and they can be used in selective breeding. So just to sum up, uh, and again, uh, I just want to say that we certainly have been innovative in looking at protein markers that have been identified for resistant stock, and I've shown that to you, and we, can, we actually enrich hygienic behavior. Uh, we've demonstrated it can be used to improve disease and mite resistance. Uh, we've also uh, produced a huge amount of phenotypic data, and I've shown you how we've mined some of that phenotypic data in the search for markers to tell us things that are predictive about bees uh, and their survival and the interrelationships of these traits. And uh, finally, I think we're uh, moving forward to uh, SNP-based markers, looking at the genomes of bees. We're not quite there yet, but we hope to have these SNP panels produced soon. And a uh, next step forward would actually be using them in a selective breeding scheme to breed bees that are more resistant uh, to mites um, and disease and to maintain their productivity. So with that, I'm going to uh, end here and thank you uh, for your attention. And uh, I'll briefly say goodbye. Well, thank you very much, Steve, for that interesting presentation. Um, we have questions coming in on that. Uh, here we go. Uh, looking at the data, Steve, I came to the conclusion that the best place to keep bees in Canada was at Beaver Lodge. The hygiene aspect was best there. The honey yield was best there. But is it just because you're there? Can you comment on why there's such variability in those uh, in the in the results you get? Well, uh, thanks for the question. Um, I'm highly biased because I, I live and work in Beaver Lodge, so I would like to say it's uh, all because of me, but it's not entirely. Um, um, I live in a unique area of, of Canada. The Peace Region has uh, these very long days and very high honey production. So that's been known for a long time. So certainly um, the, the aspect of honey production is regional uh, where we live, and it is uh, very highly desirable. Most uh, Canadian commercial beekeeping in terms of honey production is on the prairies, and we're sort of at a unique corner of those prairies, a little further up north with uh, these very beneficial conditions. I think the other thing you may be speaking to is if we look at some of the results from the studies, we're comparing these regional populations of bees. So that is really, um, those are really bees um, in part from our own research operation. So in terms of the population we studied, um, those bees are in some ways a legacy of some of the previous work we've done. So inherently uh, one bias in that population is they're probably inherently selected a little more for hygienic behavior. And I think that did influence some of the results. So uh, I uh, would suggest that if we more broadly sample bees throughout our region, uh, levels of hygienic behavior uh, in commercial beekeeping populations may be a little lower. So I think that's probably a bit of an artifact of our own, our own stock within our own operation. But um, it, it is a good place to keep bees. And uh, I do think some of the traits we have within the population we studied locally in Beaver Lodge, again, again are a bit of a legacy of the work we've been doing in the did translate into uh, better survival and disease resistance. Okay, but it's all not all just you is what you're saying. Um, you're no, not it's not all just me. <laughs> okay, so um, I mean another relevant link here, you know, for the location. We have real problems uh, rearing rearing queens here in the United Kingdom uh, because we have famously good weather all the year round, as you know. It's never cold, it's never rain, the sun never stops shining. 
You have long days, but you have a short summer. So does that give you problems with mating queens and uh, raising good colonies? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So um, we have two seasons. We call it winter and um, construction. But uh, within those two seasons, uh, we have uh, a short compressed summer. So uh, um, particularly where I live, um, you know, I would call our beekeeping season short and intense. So if you're a, a beekeeper looking to breed his or her own queens, um, you certainly have to be on top of the timing. Uh, we can't get queens made at where I am until June. Uh, and um, we can still produce a honey crop uh, from a split we make with a, a new queen uh, within that time frame. Um, but typically the colony will be too, too small to be uh, highly commercially productive, but we can still certainly uh, produce, um, you know, good manageable colonies. I think the, the key is uh, we'd be really on top of our breeding. Uh, usually the weather is okay. It's just that we, I always feel we're constrained in terms of the number of days in our season. Everything is quite compressed. The flip side is our days are long, the productivity is high, the rate of change is really um, pretty incredible. So, uh, you know, we can, we can still do good beekeeping. The, the, the trick is we can't produce queens very early. So that's particularly true with where I live, uh, but it's true across most of our country. Um, the only parts of our country that really can produce queens earlier in the spring are um, the west coast of British Columbia. And even there, uh, there's not a very large commercial queen supply and uh, there are still struggles with the weather. So they could certainly maybe produce queens uh, um, a month earlier, but uh, not much earlier than that. So I think the struggles sort of depend uh, where you live. And it also feeds into why traditionally our beekeeping industry has imported so many queens from California historically uh, and Hawaii. Those are two very large sources for us because those queens are produced very early. Uh, we can get them for the end of April or beginning of May uh, in non-COVID years. That's another story. Uh, and uh, certainly to, uh, replenish winter losses or to uh, increase the number of colonies. That's a really good mechanism for beekeepers to uh, to do that quickly. Okay. Is there such a thing as a Canadian bee? They're not a native uh, species in Canada. Or is that under discussion? Um, yeah, I think one would be hard pressed to say we have a Canadian bee. Uh, you know, uh, as, as I say, we, I think, have sort of a bit of a mutt, uh, or Heinz 57 is another expression maybe we use. I don't know if that's a British expression or not. Uh, a mix of everything. Um, that's for two reasons. One is because we have a long history of importation, particularly from the U.S., but other uh, countries abroad, such as Australia and New Zealand. I think the one caveat I would put on this is the direction I see our beekeeping industry is moving gradually is there's more stock selection uh, within bee operations. Now that may not be novel to Britain at all, but if you compare the US, the US has a huge beekeeping industry in which the production of queens commercially is typically concentrated in a relatively small number of queen producers in California or perhaps some of the other uh, Southern US states. Uh, in Canada, the trend I see is more commercial beekeepers slowly are breeding their own stock and uh, in years where perhaps queens have been less available for from states such as California, uh, remarkably, they have bred more, even uh, under my uh, local constrained conditions. So it is possible. And in terms of a Canadian bee, guess what I would point to is we do have uh, beekeepers, we do have commercial beekeepers uh, that breed their own stock and, and never buy a queen. Uh, so in their operations, I think their stock would be locally adapted. They've been running for uh, you know several, uh, decades, and uh, that stock would be probably as locally adapted uh, as it can be within that time frame. So not really a Canadian bee, but locally you could point to examples where that selection has been going on for years and it's locally adapted. Yeah, your work focuses a great deal on hygienic bees, disease resistance, honey production. We, we look for other traits even here in bees, and because a lot of beekeeping takes place in an urban environment here, uh, temper of bees is uh, quite important. 
Did you ever look at that? Does uh, does that make does that ever come into your work? And is it something that can be? Do you think that's something you can pick up by looking at the genome? Yeah, it, it is something we have uh, looked at. Um, I, um, in the interest of my already slightly too long talk, I took it out. Um, but uh, certainly uh, in a more recent work that I discussed in which we're still developing uh, genetic markers, it is actually one of the uh, traits we also looked at, uh, which was um, uh, defensive behavior. So um, I can tell you the way in which we evaluated it was um, by using a, um, a black patch that was suspended over a colony uh, under um, conditions that were uh, similar um, among the colonies, uh, weather conditions that were similar, et cetera. And we looked at the, the uh, rate of stinging of that patch. So um, it was almost like fishing with a little uh, square black patch above the colonies, but by counting numbers of stings was one way in which we measured uh, how defensive colonies were. Uh, it is a trait of interest to our beekeepers here as well, um, mainly because no beekeeper wants to work highly defensive colonies and, and quite right uh, if beekeepers have bees uh, near urban areas that can be uh, more of a concern. Um, I'm uh, you know, a sort of inheritance for uh, defensive behavior has been a, a, a tricky thing to understand over the years. Um, there's been considerable work done with um, Africanized bees and looking at areas of the genome that are associated with defensive behavior. Um, so far, I, I'm not aware of other assays that are uh, much different from that for selection. And uh, in terms of our own genetic analysis, we're, uh, um, we don't quite have all of the results in yet to say whether in fact we found reliable markers. So I can just say that we've evaluated for it. Uh, our beekeepers are interested in it. And uh, I guess it, it remains to be determined whether we find uh, stable markers that will be predictive. Yeah, okay. All right, you're selecting for traits uh, uh, that you consider to be good. Um, and you followed those through, you see how they survive over three generations. Um, this is a bit of a, a Rumsfeld type question. Are you losing unknown unknowns? Are you losing good traits uh, while you're doing this uh, selection? Are they being bred out at all? Can you comment on that? Well, that's always, um, <clears throat> that's always a reasonable question to ask in, in breeding, I think the only way to answer that is to really monitor your traits of interest. And I think in most of our studies, we've uh, kept uh, monitoring the economically important traits. So I should also point out a lot of our work has been um, searching for tools to breed bees. We have done uh, some breeding projects to look at their effectiveness, but I would not say that the focus of my research has been a long-term breeding project to follow selection on a narrow trade over many generations. And um, looking at stock like that and looking at the effect on other economically important traits um, would tell you that. So um, not sure if I'm answering your question well, but that's a valid concern. And, uh, and I would say that if whenever we focus uh, on, on a trait that's very highly specialized and we um, you know, uh, narrow our breeding pool, to try and enhance that trait. Maybe it's for our resistance or hygienic behavior. We do have to be mindful of our other economically important traits. But uh, I think all of you as beekeepers would, would know if your bees were um, hot, as we would say, if they're unfriendly to work with, um, if they didn't produce honey, uh, or in particularly in our climate, and I'm sure in Britain too, if they, they don't survive winter well. And, um, you know, certainly, um, Beekeepers have to be able to make money uh, from their bees and they quickly recognize uh, whether perhaps um, some of those traits are, are perhaps being diluted if we, we focus too much on an individual uh, trait. So I may not go exactly to the heart of your question, but to the extent possible, we, we are mindful of that in, uh, in selection. Sure. Um, and uh, basically, uh, those good traits you've selected, you've gone through to F3. Do you have you, do they stay? If you have a look at them a few more generations on, did you ever look that far? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I think 
one way I can comment on that is um, is it depends so much somewhat on the inheritance of the trait. Uh, but I think in general, I would say you know whenever we're we're trying to enhance a trait in a population, it does require uh, some degree of constant selection in, uh, in in the breeding that's done. Uh, hygienic behavior is a good example. Um, earlier in my career, we were quite interested to see whether uh, we could have our producers in northern Alberta, and we had a number of cooperating beekeepers uh, in the study participate with us, in which we selected their own stock. Uh, we shared it amongst each other. It was sort of a cross-fostering experiment, and we maternally selected <clears throat> um, and produced uh, virgin queens, which were allowed to openly mate in the beekeeping operations. So in the study we did with hygienic behavior, which was over four or five generations, as I recall, um, we had selected uh, virgins going into those operations, but they were openly mated with um, whatever drones were in that beekeeper's operation. And even though we selected maternally for four or five generations, we were able to make modest increases in hygienic behavior. Uh, but what it really showed to us is that selection on the drone scores was also is always very important in a trait like hygienic behavior really to make consistent gains, um, you're going to have to ensure that uh, your selected virgins are, are mating with uh, selected drones. So I think the the part of that is to, um, you know, you can't um, hope to introduce a trait uh, that's at a very high frequency and, and leave it there. It's going to require a constant maintenance. And in the case of hygienic behavior, I would say certainly over a, a few generations, you're gonna see that trait quickly lost if uh, your, your drone sources aren't selected. So I guess the answer there is to keep ensuring your drone sources are selected for mating. Very good. Well, look, we're coming, running out of time, as they often say when the conversation gets difficult, but uh, we, we really are running out of time. And I just want to ask you one more question, Steve, somebody sent, sent in. So you've got VSH Queens now, now, if you, what sort of resources would you need to, say, produce a quarter of a million queens with those characteristics? And would it be worth spending that money? Would it change life in honey production or, or whatever? Well, that's a, a very big question to end with. Um, would it be possible to reduce a quarter million queens in Canada? With a huge amount of effort, yes. Um, although the queens we would produce would be much later in the season than beekeepers would normally like. <clears throat> so it would be possible, but it would require quite a bit of entrepreneurship and um, large scale setup of queen breeders in selected areas of Canada. Or in fact, what would be more successful is if the majority of all commercial beekeepers produce their own to produce those 250,000 queens and, and not may all have the resources or the expertise to be willing to. So I, I think, you know, we, I think we're moving somewhere where we have more technology and I think where we want to move the industry, uh, move the pendulum more so that more commercial beekeepers or beekeepers in general are selecting their own stock, whether it's going to be a quarter million queens or not um, is quite debatable, but uh, more would be better. And part of the reason for that, not only in improving our own stock, it's also just because of the precarious nature of imports. Uh, if there are big differences between the health of Canadian bees and bees in the U.S., uh, that can create uh, bottlenecks or embargoes for the importation of queens. And that's always a very sensitive issue in uh, the Canadian sure. beekeeping sure. industry. So I think we can make progress, but 250,000 queens would be a big challenge. Very good, and a lot of money for that. We have pretty well got through most of the questions. A couple have come through just now that we, we can't take. We're out of time. So, uh, Steve, thank you very much for your talk and for uh, this grilling that uh, you've just endured. <laughs>